Hi, my name is Laura, and welcome to my podcast, Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with their movie adaptations, and through these discussions, you will hear why, nine times out of ten, the book wins. I'll also share different behind-the-scenes trivia I've discovered in my research, which by learning makes the story all the more interesting. If you love either books, movies, or both, this is the perfect podcast for you. This probably already goes without saying, but there will be spoilers for both the book and the movie in this podcast. So if you plan on reading the book or watching the movie, go do that first and then come back and listen to this. And now without further ado, let's get right into it. Hi, welcome back. Today I am talking about Annihilation. It is a book written by James Vandermeer, published in 2014. And then the movie Annihilation was directed by Alex Garland and released in 2018. I've actually been meaning to watch Annihilation ever since it came out. Unfortunately, I missed my opportunity to see it in theaters, so I had to watch it on TV. But I recently saw it was based on a book, and so it, I immediately bumped it to the top of my list. And so after reading the book, this was my first time watching the movie, so I, I still had yet to watch it up until now. So I almost don't even know where to begin with this book and movie. But I guess I will start with the author. So James Vandermeer is an American author known for creating the writing style called New Weird. Annihilation is the first in the Southern Reach trilogy, all of which were released in the same year, just months apart. And this is the first of his books I've read, but I plan on reading the rest of the Southern Reach trilogy, as well as some of his others. Finch sounds especially interesting and weird. It's a crime book that takes place in a city where half the population are mushroom people. In a Reddit Ask Me Anything, someone asked about how he is inspired to write these unique, weird stories, and he said, I'm kind of a method writer. I'll use any and all of that, though not drugs, to get into the right mental space to write from a character's point of view. So for example, during writing Authority, which is part of the Southern Reach trilogy, I went through a period of insomnia and also a period of being a little bit paranoid. I channeled both things into the character of control rather than trying to deal with those things. I actually, in almost an actorly way, accentuated both. I didn't try to get more sleep, I just used it. You can find there's more of the world around you that gets pulled into your fiction that way. And there's kind of an almost evil laugh in the back of the writer's head, I think, when they encounter setbacks or negative things that your fiction brain realize can be fodder for narrative. You almost exist in two states at once, the one in which it is just horrible and you can't sleep, and the other that's chortling to itself, you're going to get two really good scenes out of this. But every writer is different. I don't believe writers have to suffer, per se, to write good fiction. So I thought that was interesting, because oftentimes books like this, I know a lot of people, including me, when I read it, part of me just assumes, like, man, like, this guy must have done drugs, and that's why he has these crazy stories. Which, I mean, he specifically said he doesn't use drugs. But, yeah, so if you're trusting what he says. So it's interesting that he just uses insomnia and just things you go through anyway, naturally. So I've never heard that before, but yeah, pretty interesting. I usually begin these with a synopsis, but the book and the movie have a very different storyline, though they have the same basic premise, so I'll just start with that. So Area X is a mysterious section of land that was taken over by some kind of life form. The Southern Reach Command studies it and send expedition groups into it, but no one has ever returned. That is, until the 11th expedition. Suddenly, all the members of that expedition just return straight to their homes. They're not themselves, though, and they are all eventually brought back to the Southern Reach Command. Each person from that expedition eventually gets cancer and then dies. One of these men is married to a biologist, and after the death of her husband, she volunteers to be part of the next expedition. While in Area X, or in the movie they call it The Shimmer, So while there, she sees how nature is taking over in some shocking, weird, and sometimes beautiful ways. My thoughts on the book? So this book grabbed me right away. Within 24 hours of starting it, I had finished it. It's written from the perspective of the biologist who is writing in her journal. None of the characters are given names, just called by their title, like what they are brought into Area X to do. So there is the biologist, the surveyor, the anthropologist, and the psychologist. Time in Area X differs from the normal world, and it seems as though she covers just a few days of her time there, but who knows, maybe in our world it was actually longer. Intertwined with her exploring Area X are flashbacks to her childhood, her marriage, and the training they received before heading out. Training, by the way, that was all based on a lie, as she later finds out. 
This is sci-fi, but I really love the parts where she talked about her relationship with her husband. And as the book goes on, she learns more and more about him. And by the end, she is closer to him and has a better understanding of him than she ever had before. When her husband returns home, he is no longer himself. And he and the rest that return have just this glazed over quality. And when asked what they saw, they just say it was beautiful. While in Area X, the biologist comes across his journal and while reading it, realizes that he was directing what he wrote to her. As she reads what he actually experienced and learns more about who he was, she says, Slowly, painfully, I realized what I had been reading from the very first words of his journal. My husband had had an inner life that went beyond his gregarious exterior. If I had known enough to let him inside my guard, I might have understood this fact. Except I hadn't, of course. I had let tidal pools and fungi that could devour plastic inside my guard, but not him. Of all the aspects of his journal, this ate at me the most. He had created his share of our problems by pushing me too hard, by wanting too much, by trying to see something in me that didn't exist. But I could have met him part way and retained my sovereignty. And now it was too late. Later in the trilogy, we learn more about how Area X began. But in this book, there are little to no answers given. Part of me was frustrated because I wanted to know like, what had caused this whole thing. And as I was reading, I was expecting there to be more explanation as I continued reading. But this isn't written from the perspective of an omniscient narrator, and we only find out what the biologist finds out. The more I let the story sit with me, the more I actually liked the lack of knowledge that we're given. Th this lack of information also gives you more incentive to read the other two books where some of these questions are answered. On receiving more answers in the subsequent books, Vandermeer said, I do think readers get the answers they want in acceptance which is the last book in the trilogy. But you also have to recognize that the series is about grappling with the unknown. There are limits to our understanding. So I like that, that he doesn't even try to give an explanation and explain everything, especially when dealing with, I don't know, something so alien, literally, something that we just can't comprehend even. So I thought that was cool. And I'm also not someone who needs, you know, every detail explained to me at the end. Like sometimes when books explain too much about what happens to all the characters it bothers me because I I think I've mentioned this before but I like having some of that ambiguity that just because it sticks with you more so with the movie this is directed by Alex Garland who became well known when he wrote and directed the sci-fi sci movie Ex Machina which is incredible and I highly recommend he had read Annihilation and then later he wrote the script rather than rereading the book and using it as more of a reference he decided to base the, base the script off what lingered dreamlike in his brain from the book. Writer Jeff Vandermeer is quoted as saying this about the movie. I appreciate Garland's aptness for the visionary and gritty. It is truly an intense and epic film that will leave filmgoers feeling drained by the end. While at the same time, readers of the, no readers of the novels have to think of the movie as an alt area X, alt Southern Reach experience. I can't deny that I mourn some of those changes on a very deep level. Also, it is very difficult to experience a film when you visited the set. I have very fond memories of meeting, for example, Tessa Thompson and Gina Rodriguez, and then seeing them active on Twitter about the movie. So all of that forms an overlay as well, which I hadn't expected. Alex Garland, I think, is the perfect person to turn Area X into a movie. He captured that weird, dreamlike, otherworldly, creepy, yet beautiful world of Annihilation. So on to the acting. We have Natalie Portman in the lead role of Lena, the biologist. She is, of course, spectacular and is a great pick for the role. Jennifer Jason Lee plays Dr. Ventress, the psychologist. She really shows the toll working for the Southern Command and just the toll it's taken on her as she interviews year after year all these people that get sent into the Shimmer. And she also has a pretty disquieting presence and it really adds to the atmosphere. Oscar Isaacs is Lena's husband, Kane. He has a fair amount of screen time between the flashbacks and the video footage that is shown of him. He's also amazing and, you know, it's just eerie seeing him as he basically loses his mind in the shimmer. Tessa Thompson, Gina Rodriguez, and Tuba Nontani play the other three that are, are on the expedition and all give stellar performances as each goes crazy or comes to terms with what has happened. Each of their deaths also reflect what they had struggled with in life which is so beautiful in an artistic way. Like they aren't just characters that exist only to be killed, the way a lot of horror movie characters are. And when you watch it, notice what they all had struggled with in life, like the things that led them to be willing to go into the shimmer. 
and then compare that with how they all end up dying and you'll see just like it almost mirrors what they dealt with in life kind of so it's yeah it's really beautiful and so I really like that. So the differences regarding entering Area X. As said, as said in the synopsis, everyone from Expedition 11 comes back, not just her husband. The biologist is also aware that he was going into Area X. It had been around for like 30 years at that point, and it was just common knowledge for the most part. She didn't want him to go, partly because it was dangerous, but there was also part of her that was jealous because her work, it was uninteresting and tiring and she envied that he was going to do something so unknown and exciting whereas in the movie he's still in the military and he doesn't tell her where she he's going and she doesn't even know what area x is and like he leads her to believe that he's going on another military deployment in the book the psychologist hypnotizes them as they prepare to cross the border apparently crossing the border is too much for anyone to handle much of like what happens in area x The movie shows them going through the border, but then they wake up and they're like four days in. It doesn't say that their memory loss was due to hypnosis, as it is in the book. It makes it seem like it's just the result of being in the shimmer. The book has them forget the border, as I said, due to hypnosis, but the biologist does remember the days of hiking as they approach base camp. So in the book, she doesn't forget that many days, which is an incredibly minor change. So just the details regarding Expedition 12 and the differences there. So the movie gives names and backstories to the members of the expedition. In the book, as said above, nothing personal is told of anyone else. We, we don't know anyone's names. Their looks are never even described. And we don't know anything about their past. Although we do know that the surveyor is former military. Unlike the movie, the biologist was not former military. And then when the psychologist dies, the biologist goes through her things and sees what she assumes must have been her name. And then she says... I had not seen a name or heard a name spoken aloud for months, and seeing one now bothered me deeply. It seemed wrong, as if it did not belong to Area X. A name was a dangerous luxury here. Sacrifice didn't need names. People who served a function didn't need to be named. In all ways, the name was a further unwanted confusion to me, a dark space that kept growing and growing in my mind. When she then approaches base camp, the surveyor, who had been at base camp while she saw the psychologist, but we'll talk about that later. Anyway, when she approaches base camp, the surveyor can see that she's no longer human, which we'll get into those details later as well. And so the surveyor shoots her. The biologist ducks down and they have this brief conversation as the biologist tries to convince the surveyor to stop shooting. The surveyor asks her what her name is. And the biologist says, what difference does it make? It doesn't make a difference what my name is. So even as a way to potentially save her own life by telling her name and humanizing herself, she doesn't want to say the name she had used in the world. So it she was that she had that strong of an aversion to it. The movie allows us to learn about the woman and their reasons for volunteering in Area X. The woman named Shepard dies early on, but we still get a feel for the kind of person she is. This is kind of similar to the death of the anthropologist in the book. And then both Shepard and the anthropologist, after they die, they like sort of come back in a way and have to be fought off. We learn more about the other three as well. And even though all but the main character die, we see how each of them transform through the course of the movie. And similar to the, bur- similar to the book, we learn more about the psychologist before she dies and the surveyor, too. And on to the lighthouse. In the book, we find out that whatever has taken over Area X came from the sea and attacked the lighthouse. At least we think it's from the sea. While in there, the biologist finds a picture of the lighthouse keeper, who had been the lighthouse keeper at that time. She also finds piles upon piles of journals from previous expeditions, many more than could have been written by just 12 trips in there. So how many expeditions have there truly been? She realizes that the training they received was useless, and the trainers knew it. While leaving the lighthouse outside, she sees the psychologist, who had abandoned her and the surveyor earlier when the two of them were in the tower. She's able to talk to the psychologist before she dies, and I really like this scene. The attitude of the psychologist during her last moments I found really interesting really interesting and even entertaining. And she also keeps mentioning how the biologist is changing, but the biologist resists this each time it's said. In the movie, she does have a final conversation with the psychologist while in the lighthouse, but it's very different. In the movie, they're all being infected with Area X, or the Shimmer, in one way or another, and flames and colors come out of the psychologist's mouth before she 
dies slash disappears slash becomes this other thing. In the book, the biologist at one point says how her brightness is so strong. She imagines that if she breathed out of her mouth, like wisps of light would have come out. And so this is kind of similar to what we see in the movie with Dr. Ventress. In the book, she confronts this other living thing while in the tower. But in the movie, they don't have the tower. So it all takes place in the lighthouse. In this whole scene, when Dr. Ventress like transforms into this thing, uh, it was so cool and so stunning. And it really made me wish I could have seen this in theaters. Even though it's not the same as in the book, it had that same otherworldly time-stopping vibe. And the music in this movie is also so amazing and really helps create that weird atmosphere. And I'll get to it soon, but in the book we have a craw- the crawler, this creature named the crawler who was once human. And here we have Ventress who sort of becomes this weird abstract thing. I was listening to a podcast called Ink to Film, which is a podcast where they're doing the same thing as I am comparing books and movies. And so I was listening to their episode about this movie and they shared the opinion that maybe since Dr. Ventress had cancer, that's why she was chosen, so to speak, as the one to become this thing. And I, you know, makes sense to me. By the way, the Ink to Film podcast is fantastic. For a movie as complex as this, it was really helpful to listen to their insightful take on the movie. On to the tower. The book begins with them discovering a tower that is in the ground. Some call it a tunnel, but the biologist thinks of it as a tower going down into the ground with a spiral staircase. It hadn't been on the maps provided by previous expeditions, so it is extra mysterious. Some of them go down into it and see words written on the wall made of this weird living fungi. The biologist leans in to get a better look, and when she does so, gold spores like spray out onto her face and get in her nose. The others don't see it, though, because she had been standing so close, and she doesn't want to tell them that she has been infected with something until she can see if there are any side effects, which, of course, there will be. The tower and the words being written are the main focus of Area X. There is the lighthouse, which she spends a day in and much is learned, but the mystery and suspense are really in the tower. The words that are being written don't totally make sense, and according to Vandermeer, they aren't meant to make sense. It's being written by what is called the crawler, this life form taking over that section of the world trying to mimic human ideas as well as their bodies. So the words are like a mutated version of the human ideas, the same way that humans become mutated versions of themselves, and like the clones are mutated versions of humans, if that makes sense. By the end of the book, the biologist is the only one left, and she has this brightness within her caused by the spores, and the brightness is literal, and she glows, and it also heightens her senses. And eventually, she makes her way down the tunnel slash tower, which also the it's the tower is like a living thing. The walls are fleshy and there is a heartbeat. And early on, she says it seems like they were going into the gullet of a beast. She feels she can't leave Area X without knowing what is writing the words on the wall and what it all means. So her final trip down there, she comes across the crawler, which is what she had named it. When she tries to see what it even is, she says, As I adjusted to the light, the crawler kept changing at a lightning pace, as if to mock my ability to comprehend it. It was a figure with a series of layers in the shapes of an archway. It was a great slug-like monster ringed by satellites of even otter creatures. It was a glistening star. My eyes kept glancing off it as if an optic nerve was not enough. She then has the sensation that she is drowning, which lasts for what feels like forever. And earlier on in the book, she says that she has a fear of drowning, which leads us to assume that when faced with a crawler, you feel whatever it is you fear. The crawler eventually lets her go, and she gets away by going further down the tower. She isn't sure why it didn't kill her, though, because it had killed a previous member of the expedition. When she inevitably has to go back up the tower to leave, she cross paths with it a second time, but it does nothing to her because, you know, it's already gotten the information it needed from her. So as she walks by, it just continues to write. She takes one look back at it and says, Staring back at me amid that profusion of selves generated by the crawler, I saw, barely visible, the face of a man, hooded in shadow and orbited by indescribable things I could think of only as his jailers. This man's expression displayed such a complex and naked extremity of emotion that it transfixed me. I saw on those features the endurance of an unending pain and sorrow, yes, but shining through as well was a kind of grim satisfaction and ecstasy. I had never seen such an expression before, but I recognized that face— 
I seen it in a photograph. A sharp eagle's eye gleamed out of that heavy face, the left eye lost to his squint. A thick beard hid all but a hint of a firm chin, chin under it. Trapped within the crawler, the last lighthouse keeper stared out at me, so it seemed not just across a vast, unbridgeable gulf, but also out across the years. For, though thinner, his eyes were seated into their orbits, his jawline more pronounced. The lighthouse keeper had not aged a day since that photograph was taken more than 30 years ago. This man, who now existed in a place none of us could comprehend, did he know what he had become, or had he gone mad long ago? Could he even really see me? Throughout the book, she talks about seeing animals appear very human-like, and this last part with the crawler confirms this, so whatever it is that is taking over Area X, it isn't killing people, but transforming them. Although in some cases, it does kill them too, I guess. So on to her husband. In both when her husband comes home, he is not himself. He is too normal, but so normal that it's unsettling and not at all the way he was before. So she calls Southern Reach and they come and take him back to their facilities. In the movie, he starts having an attack, I think, and she calls the ambulance. Then as the ambulance is driving, it's overtaken by this mysterious group and he is taken away. Later, she is then brought to the Southern Command where they tell her all about Area X. And in the movie, it's been around for like three years. Whereas, as I said in the book, it's existed for over 30. The movie shows them as having had a close relationship, but she ends up having an affair, which it seems he has found out about. In the book, their marriage had problems for different reasons. The biologist was very much an introvert and had a hard time opening up to people. Her husband nicknamed her Ghost Bird because she didn't socialize, and when they were out with a group, she would just linger on the outskirts and keep to herself. Before he leaves, he tells her that if he doesn't come back, well, she'll go in after him, or he asks her. And she just says, of course you'll be back. And now she regrets not having answered him. And even more so, she regrets that even now, the truth is that she hadn't gone back into Area X for him. She had done it for her. The movie shows that her husband committed suicide while his doppelganger went into the world. In the book, through his journals, we learn that he saw his doppelganger going into the tower, but he was scared and didn't know what to do. In the end, he gets a boat and he decides to sail out to sea to try to reach this island that's in the distance. Whether he makes it there, dies, or becomes one of these mutated human animals is unknown. It also seems intentional to me that in the movie, the husband's name is Cain. In the book, he doesn't have a name, like none of the characters do, as I said. But Cain in the Bible committed the first murder. He killed his brother Abel. So they were living on this newly created land, and he tarnishes it by killing his brother and then burying him in the land. Cain's doppelganger in the movie, in a way, you know, even though Cain committed suicide, the doppelganger, you know, obviously had something to do with that. And then this Cain doppelganger goes into the world and begins to infect and tarnish the land which has been kept clean from whatever it is that's in Area X. I Google this to see if anyone else had these thoughts, you know, connecting his name to the biblical Cain, but... No one said anything, so I don't know. Maybe it, that's not the case. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I thought it was interesting. So on to the meaning of the title, Annihilation. In the book, the psychologist hypnotizes them more than they were led to believe. So as I said, she hypnotizes them when they enter, when they cross the border. And so they realized she was going to do that. But after the biologist is infected with the spores, she is no longer susceptible to the hypnosis and that makes her realize how often it's actually being used on them. And then later, when the biologist approaches the psychologist before she dies, the psychologist is saying, annihilation, annihilation. The biologist later learns that the word is supposed to induce suicide in whoever is under the hypnosis. So they were all unknowingly programmed with a self-destruct button. And self-destruction is a big theme in the movie. Lena self-destructs a happy marriage. The other members of the group self-destruct with drugs, hurting oneself physically, or losing who you are when you go through a personal trauma. And then, you know, the doctor has cancer, which cancer is a... Maybe she didn't make the cancer happen, but cancer is self-destructing, kind of. And in the end, Lena faces her alien mirror image and puts a grenade in its hand. She is doing this to cause it to self-destruct and destroy the shimmer. Whether or not this actually causes the shimmer to be destroyed or causes it to encompass the world or maybe it expands the region is unknown. They lead us to believe the shimmer has been destroyed, but I am suspicious about that. And then the last scene shows Lena and Kane, and Kane acknowledges that 
it isn't the real him. And Lena, you know, he asks her and she just doesn't say whether or not it's really her. But then in their eyes, like you can see the shimmer in their eyes. I think that it is like physically the same Lena, but she's, you know, while she's in the shimmer, she looks at her DNA and sees that she has started to alter from being inside Area X. And so even though when she comes out, she's the same person literally as who she was when she went in. But she's no longer the same and is becoming the mutated form of herself, if that makes sense. And then there's a tattoo that now appears on her arm. And it's not only an image that mirrors itself, but it's also a snake eating itself going along with the self-destruction theme. The title in regards to the movie can reference either the annihilation of our world as the shimmer takes over our cells in our world or to the destruction we create in our own lives. The book ends with the biologist leaving her journal which we have been reading atop the pile of all the other journals. And then she sets out on the ocean, the same as her husband had. Whereas, as I said, the movie ends with her and Kane having that exchange. So how did Area X come to be? The movie shows that a meteor hits this coastal area and it, it infects the land and continues to grow and expand. Like a tumor or a cancer that gets bigger and bigger, replicating the good cells and creating cancerous cells in the same likeness, which then ruin or mutate the good ones. The biologist kept resisting the idea that she had changed when the psychologist kept mentioning it. In the end of the book, though, she says, The terrible thing, the thought I cannot dislodge after all I have seen, is that I can no longer say with conviction that this, what is happening in Area X, is a bad thing. Not when looking at the pristine nature of Area X and the world beyond, which we have altered so much. Before she died, the psychologist said I had changed, and I think she meant I had changed sides. It isn't true. I don't even know if there are sides or what that might mean. But it could be true. I see now that I could be persuaded. A religious or superstitious person, someone who believed in angels or in demons, might see it differently. Almost anyone might see it differently. But I am not those people. I am just the biologist. I don't require any of this to have a deeper meaning. I am aware that all of this speculation is incomplete, inexact, inaccurate, useless. If I don't have real answers... It is because we still don't know what questions to ask. Our instruments are useless. Our our methodology broken. Our motivations selfish. She also tries to understand what it is that has taken over this part of the world and figure out more about what happened with the lighthouse keeper. This passage that I'm about to read sort of goes into how Area X came to be and how all these expeditions keep causing Area X to grow. I wanted, I needed to know what I had indeed seen in him, not some apparition conjured up by the crawler, and I had clutched at anything that would help me believe that. What convinced me the most wasn't even the photograph. It was the sample the anthropologist had taken from the edge of the crawler, the sample that had proven to be human brain tissue. So with that as my anchor, I began to form a a narrative for the lighthouse keeper as best I could, even as I stood and once again made my way back to the base camp. It was difficult because I knew nothing at all about his life, had none of those indicators that might have allowed me to imagine him. I had just a photograph and that terrible glimpse of him inside the tower. All I could think was that this was a man who had a normal life once, perhaps, but not one of those familiar rituals that define normal had any permanence or helped him. He had been caught up in a storm that hadn't yet abated. Perhaps he had even seen it coming from the top of the lighthouse, the event arriving like a kind of wave. And what had manifested? What do I believe manifested? Think of it as a thorn, perhaps. A long, thick thorn, so large it is buried deep in the side of the world, injecting itself into the world. Emanating from this giant thorn is an endless, perhaps automatic, need to assimilate and to mimic. Assimilator and assimilated interact through the catalyst of a script of words, which powers the engine of transformation. Perhaps it is a creature living in perfect symbiosis with a host of other creatures. Perhaps it is merely a machine. But in either instance, if it has intelligence, that intelligence is far different from our own. It creates out of our ecosystem a new world whose processes and aims are utterly alien, one that works through supreme acts of mirroring. And by remaining hidden in so many other ways, all without surrendering the foundations of its otherness has become what it encounters. I do not know how this thorn got here, or from how far away it came, but by luck or fate or design, at some point it found the lighthouse keeper and did not let him go. How long he had as it remade him, repurposed him, is a mystery. There was no one to observe, to bear witness, until 30 years later, a biologist catches a glimpse of him and speculates on what he might have become. Catalyst, spark, engine, the grit that made the pearl, or merely merely an unwilling passenger. 
And after his fate was determined, imagine the expeditions. 12 or 50 or 100, it doesn't matter. They keep coming into contact with that entity or entities that keep becoming fodder and becoming remade. These expeditions that come here at a hidden entry point along a mysterious border, an entry point that perhaps is mirrored within the deepest depths of the tower. Imagine these expeditions and then recognize that they all still exist in Area X in some form, even the ones that came back, especially the ones that came back, layered over one another, communicating in whatever way is left to them. Imagine that th this communication sometimes lends a sense of the uncanny to the landscape because of the narcissis narcissism of our human gaze, but that it is just part of the natural world here. I may never know what triggered the creation of the doppelgangers, but it may not matter. And this last part kind of goes along with the movie where Lena is asked what it wanted, and Lena replies, I don't think it wanted anything. So it doesn't have, you know, the human motivations, it just is. And so it really, it's not evil because it doesn't have evil motivations. It doesn't, yeah, it just is existing and how it knows how, basically. So whether or not I would pick the book or the movie, this one is truly a toss up, largely due to the fact that Garland didn't try to follow the source entirely and instead made it his own while still keeping the vibe of the book. I honestly, I would highly recommend both, though it's not the kind of book or movie I would recommend to just anyone because they are both like truly sci-fi in all their weird cerebral glory, which is why sci-fi is one of my favorite genres, because it's just, I don't know, it's just so out there and really makes you think and it sticks with you. Uh, dramas are my other favorite, by the way, but I know drama is kind of a broad description. But both book and movie are creepy and eerie, though the movie was a bit more horror-like than I had expected. I shouldn't have been that surprised, though, because there were some fairly gruesome, disturbing scenes in the book. The book also talks about how there is a moaning that happens every night, and this would have been a cool addition to the movie because it definitely contributed to the creepiness of Area X at night. Even after reading this, you should still go back and check out both the book and the movie, whichever one you haven't seen or read, because there is so much that takes place in both that I didn't even cover. And I can't wait to read more Jeff Vandermeer books. I bought the Southern Reach trilogy online, so at some point I'll take a week off of doing this podcast and dedicate my time to reading those books. I also really want to read Finch, like I mentioned, but it's out of print, and so it's hard to find a copy for sale that isn't below $100, though it will go into reprint again in January of 2022, so I guess I could always just wait till then. I'm also excited for Alex Garland to come out with another movie or TV show. I watched his show Devs last year and I loved it. You just never know what to expect with him. And like I said, you know, the sci-fi and like the weird stuff he creates, it just really sits with you. And speaking of Alex Garland, join me next week as we travel to The Beach, which is a book written by Alex Garland. So before he was a director and screenwriter, he wrote this novel and it was then turned into a movie star starring Leonardo DiCaprio. So I will be talking about that one next week, and I would love for you to join me for that. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, head over to my site, whythebookwins.com. You can leave a comment there, and I will be sure to reply. You can also find me on Instagram under the same name, whythebookwins, and you can message me there, and don't forget to follow. And also don't forget to subscribe to my podcast and join me next Wednesday for the newest episode of Why the Book Wins. Why the Book Wins.